Oh, I have had such fun these last few days because people are amazing. And you know, you meet so many new friends in the course of doing this work. And the kind of people who are attracted to this work are people you want as friends. Um, so it's always such a, a privilege um, to be here. And, and for some reason, I now have more close friends in Denmark than in any country of the world, including the United States. I feel very much at home, and I never quite know why I got adopted here. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm so glad that it happened. Um, some of you who have been around me before know that my giving a PowerPoint is a, a extremely unusual. It's almost a deviant act for me in my methodologies because my, my love is really uh, community building against the odds um, and in a way which really um, brings forth the, the strengths and skills and hopes and dreams in a way that gains a coherence out of the community itself. And just by way of a, a preview in Imagine Chicago, I've never had an organization that had more than five people. And four of those people have usually been under 21 years old in their first job. So the first time that I had a Danish delegation come to visit me in Chicago, there were 20 people in the delegation, which completely was a lot bigger than my office. And they kept kind of opening doors looking for where the organization was. <laughs> and, and I said, I don't know what you've been told, but this is it. You know, we are infinitely small. And the advantage of being infinitely small is that you never can afford to get confused about whose work it is. <laughs> You know, because when people would say, do you have the money, I would, I would laugh and say, of course we don't. You know, do you have the staff? Of course we don't. You know, so, so there are some advantages to being in a kind of David and Goliath mentality when you do work at human scale because it's always in the one person that leads. It, it doesn't matter what the work is. It's always that way. You know, and so just so you don't think this is an empire, it is really not an empire, and I now live full time in a forest to take care of my 93-year-old mother who is alive and well and wants my company. That's what I do in life now, you know? And then I come to conferences like this and I think, oh, and there's a big world out there. But it's to me all the same work. It's exactly the same. <laughs> so, not to get too grandiose about anything. I've given you a set of PowerPoint slides because sometimes it's useful to not have to take notes or to just take notes on what you're saying about what's on the screen instead of what's on the screen. That's the only reason you have those. Um, and I, I can use them as a frame of reference, but I may not. But here's what it says. The backstory of my work in the world is that in 1991, I'm a priest, I was a corporate banker for decades, as unimaginable as that is to me. And I'm living as a result at an intersection point in the life of our city, pastoring a black church and running a multinational banking division, and, and the mother of three small children. And I, I really began to see how divided the imagination of our city was and how much we were institutionalizing the divisions in all kinds of ways, government, community. <laughs> young, old, black, white, a lot of divides that were really characterizing our common life. And the effect of that, very practically, was that many young people were dying and being murdered. <laughs> and they were killing each other or drinking themselves to death because they didn't see that they had a viable future. So we were discounting the majority of people <laughs> who could contribute and the people who were, quote, doing the work were exhausted this is not a system in balance. And so I decided, I, I began asking a kind of pesky question, which, again, long story, I won't tell you, but as a result of, an, of a very, of really being blessed by a homeless man. That's the short story. You can hear the long one sometime if you want. But out of that place, really beginning to think about what if there really is an undivided unity? You know, what if, the, what if the truth about life is that we're really all connected? And that all these socially constructed divisions are, are simply that. 
and that we lived from, from a practice that always, that always presupposed <laughs> the unity at the heart of things instead of presupposed that the divisions were what was real. Then we wouldn't always have to be building things and reaching out and constructing things. We would simply be living into what science and nature tell us is the way things are. <laughs> it's a different mindset, revealing the unity instead of having to create it. So I started to ask the question, who thinks about the city as a whole? So who trusts that there is, that <laughs> proceeding from unity is a possible way to think and organizes accordingly? Well, very few people got named, but, but for lots of reasons you can understand. Oh well, I've been taken off the mic. Um, but anyone who got named, I ended up inviting to a conference, which we title Faith, Imagination, and Public Life because I became convinced that really what was the limit in the way we were doing things was our imagination in the way we were seeing things. <laughs> and that if we could understand the imagination out of which we were doing our public life, that we might be able to proceed <laughs> in some more creative ways. And again, science was on our side. Cells do that. You know, fortunately, we're built to be resilient and to survive, and that's the way life works. That's adaptive change. So I thought, good, that, you know, that's a consolation. At that conference, someone asked a very provocative, uh, a very provocative question, which, were, which was, because this was about faith, imagination, and public life, and not, not religion, but sort of what are the core beliefs out of which you live and live your life? because we all do that. <laughs> so it's worth thinking about what that is. <laughs> you know, whatever you trust. And someone said, what are God's dreams for Chicago? Well, that was, a, that was a provocative thing to say because it was saying, what is such a transcendent purpose which draws you that it's bigger than your life, it's bigger than the whole city, and you have to kind of look at the city as a whole when you think about it your relationship, your purpose with relation to the whole big thing. And how that aligns with maybe some broader purposes that you're, you're a piece of, but not in charge of. <laughs> so that was a provocative kind of question. And the image that emerged in my own imagination um, that at that point, which had never occurred to me, despite the fact that I was a banker, was, sort of what is God's economy, I thought. What is God's economy? You know, it's not the market. I know that. I work in the markets every day. Um, but, it's, but we have to have an image of an economy. And I thought, it's, an, it's simple. It's the recycling symbol, just saying an, an economy in which nothing and no one is wasted. Or to say it constructively, an economy in which everything and everyone counts. <laughs> well. When you just take that as a framework, and because I'm a person of faith, I thought, okay, if I really do believe that this is God's imagination, then it's gotta be possible, full stop. You know, we live out of our core beliefs. And so I started thinking, okay, what if we just saw this as possible? Then what would we do? So that's where, Imagine, that's where Imagine Chicago began. And, and just to be clear, when this happened, I was still a banker and a priest. I was still had a full-time job, which, I, which paid every bill in my family and which I quit four days later. And to the dismay of my family. Um, but as we began to get into this work, because we didn't have a program or a project or anything, we began, we, we organized a design team that's what we called ourselves, the design team. And it had about 20 very uncommon fellows, men and women, representing a variety of disciplines. But, but basically what we were looking at is this, you know, how do we think about the city as a whole? And in order to do that, how do we encourage many people to take that much broader perspective, to think from the whole, when we know nothing encourages us to do that? And 
from a very practical point of view, how do we create public ways of doing this? Here it says, you know, ideas, resources, experiences across well-established divides that really build those connections in powerful ways out of which new things might emerge. Um, and so that was, that was the task. It took about a year to figure out what the task was with a lot of very bright people. And um, what we ultimately came up with, which became Imagine Chicago's mission, and never had changed in 25 years, was simply to cultivate hope and civic engagement. <laughs> which is to say, to mobilize the resources, the kind of forward-reaching, <laughs> deeply held, <laughs> human-held resources, which get mobilized in community, and then to, to have people engage in things that mattered to them. Or to say, to bring together people who didn't normally get to be together, to do things that mattered to them in ways that weren't boundaried by beliefs about that thing not being possible and those people not being together productively. You know, what if we just set cynicism aside? and talked about what was possible and focused on it. And if we did it in a way where the system was now bumping in in creative, constructive, reliably constructive ways, bumping into new ideas, always with an energy to move forward into something self-defined, no one else's agenda. We had no agenda, not even a social agenda, just a, a deep hope that we could be together in the things that mattered. It was really as simple as that. And over time, we, we also really got clear that this was a capacity building initiative and that it had to work on every level of the system. Meaning, as, as my then eight-year-old daughter, who's now a very close colleague of mine, said to me, Caroline said, Mom, you know, the, the thing is, people don't really want to go to meetings. So what's going to, what's going to pe make people want to go to your meetings instead of everybody else's meetings? You have to have the funnest meetings. Because if you have the funnest meetings, people are going to want to come to your meetings instead of to the other people's meetings. And, and I thought, you know, she has a fantastic point. So when we say, you know, that they built capacity of the individual, you wanted in every encounter for the people in the room to just think, thank goodness I went to that meeting today. Now think about how many meetings you've ever been to that you leave feeling that way. <laughs> I mean, just thinking that was, that was, that again, it was hopeful, it was constructive, it was creative. My being there made a difference. I was able to contribute. I mean, just that as a screen. I am never going ever again to plan a meeting in which it's not likely that people will leave feeling that way. Right? I mean, it's such a simple thing. It's only hard to think about because we're so unaccustomed to that as our model for meetings. But, you know, I started thinking, she's right. They should be fun. And, and fun activates imagination. So, and then for the organization, but the second thing is that they had to be sort of mission focused, meaning, if you come to a meeting, it should really help you accomplish the purpose for which you're there. If it's a distraction for your job, if it's one more thing, if it's taking you away from what you're supposed to do, then shame on me for distracting you from something important that you have to do. So the second piece of that equation is if you can learn something that's really important to you as a human being, and the second thing is you can also do something for, that you're responsible for in a better way than you could otherwise accomplish it. Okay, now there's a second reason, because now you can tell your boss why you're going to the meeting. And then the third is to build networks in the city that otherwise might not exist. So that the, the project overall really begins to look like the city as a whole. <laughs> Meaning you meet people and you work with people you don't normally get to hang out with. Because relationships change things. And we used to think about this. I mentioned this to our table yesterday. I said, you know, I, I would consider this a success if simply 
the way when people say we, that we is really different. Because one really good map for thinking about the whole or not about the whole is when you say we and when you say they, who do you mean? And you think about that when you were five years old and how that was in your family and when you were 20 years old at the university and when you were 30 years old and some of you probably aren't even 30 years old. But, but just think about when I say we and they, who shows up in those columns in my life? And we wanted to shift things so that when people said we, it included the kids living in public housing. <laughs> and they meant we. They were together in something <laughs> with people that they didn't used to have as friends or colleagues. So um, anyway, this kind of took fire. But honestly, the only reason it took fire is because I think we picked a really good name. We put together imagination in place. And so people started saying, oh, we should be doing imagination in place. And that signaled the, the possible link between inspiration and action. You can do big things right where you are. I think that was the thing we did most right, was pick a good name. And then other people could see themselves inside of that connection. So I, and, and by the way, we didn't plant anything anywhere. We were way, way, way too little to do that. But people just, it was a storytelling, stories, those stories that fly from mountaintop to mountaintop. So after 25 years, which it is amazingly 25 years this year since I left the bank, um, we found out some stuff. We never operated from any theory, including appreciative inquiry, which I knew nothing about. But we became a poster child for it after we did our first project. And so I got to meet David Cooper Ryder, who just said, yes. <laughs> you know, and, uh, what, what we had done was to pair up kids living in public housing with community leaders around a set of questions that we designed that were really intuitive about how you have a conversation and that were field tested by teenagers in tough circumstances about a conversation they would like to have about the city they would like to have. So it was a citizen to citizen conversation among people who wouldn't normally meet and the people they interviewed were what we call technically glue people, people who hold the thing together against the odds. <laughs> and that could be the janitor in your public housing building who has your back, or it could be the head of the civic committee. All the same, you know, they're the glue in a city. And we had kids go out and talk to them and get their stories about what worked and what was possible. Well. That, that uh, you know, a, as we began to do this work, over time, many projects got grounded. And again, you can go to Imagine Chicago's website and read 2,000 pages of stories about how it worked, why it worked, what we learned. We were disciplined about telling the stories and documenting and evaluating and all that stuff. Because um, we wanted people to, to just see, see and understand. But here's, here are the kind of things we learned. And I'm going to put this little map up. Um, and again, I've given it to you, but really it's all in the stories. So this is not a theory or a set of principles or anything. It's really a set of practices which are nonlinear, which says, you know, in our experience, and it's only in our experience, in our experience, if you do these sorts of things in community well, Things can happen. That's about as much of an endorsement as I can give to it. But the first, not surprisingly, is simply opening space. And opening space for learning and creative engagement. Again, on Imagine Chicago's website, you can go and get for free. Everything is for free. That's another reason ideas spread that are for free. Um, but it, you can get a toolkit where it'll say, if, if that's what you're trying to do, here are 10 ways that are fun to do that. It's right there, and it's all kind of laid out if you want to read it. But you know, the first thing is, in any circumstance, we're trying to signal that the people in the room are the right people, that we're glad that they're there, that something we're here to do something which hasn't been done 
before and couldn't be done but for the people who were there. And it's around something that has gathered us. And it's often a question <laughs> that's gathered us. Because a question is itself an <coughs> invitation into relationship. So we tend to gather around questions rather than topics <laughs> or agendas. Because when a question, I need you if I have a question <laughs> to be in dialogue about it. So often, um, a way of beginning, a common way of beginning, would simply be to say, you know, in a context such as this, um, you know, what's a question that drew you here? Some question that's important in your life and work right now. And if the topic, let's say, we're dealing with green economy or community building or pick a topic that people have in common who have come into the room that day, then you might just say, in your experience, what's one thing that makes community building work? What's something that's a fundamental about community building? Just one thing. Because in that moment, I'm validating that I know that in the room, everyone is there as a person of experience. Everyone has knowledge. And it's not just to say, oh, you're a good person, you know stuff but to say what you know and 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 what you know is really enough for whatever it is that needs to be done. <laughs> we know a lot of stuff together. And we don't have to know everything ourselves. We can know little small things ourselves and it's enough in combination with other people to do what we need to do. And the third thing is often to really establish the purpose. So in addition to saying what's a question that's drawn you here and what's something you know about what we're talking about, to also say, you know, what's a very concrete hope for this time that would make you really glad to have come? Well, you know, something like that, again, so simple, but it is that it essentially says we're here in service of doing something that matters to you now. <laughs> what now must we do? <laughs> and while you may or may not be able to have that, I mean, when you, when you name that, it's not then my job to deliver that. It's our job <laughs> to attend to the fact, and it may be that you get what you really need in a coffee conversation, which is fine. This is not, <gasps> how am I gonna do 33 things in 15 minutes? You know, because that's not the point. The point is that you're raising out of the community what the work is right now at a growing edge. And you're saying we have all kinds of resources in the room <laughs> that are up to that. So, um, and I, there, yeah, opening space is pretty much my favorite thing. And so I could tell you lots and lots of stories about that. But um, here's another way you can open space is just to say, you know, what, what hope? has authority for you right now. <laughs> like on those days you are willing to just, you wanna kill your boss and kill yourself at the end of the day, then what is it that gets you back there the next day besides the need for a paycheck? You say, but I saw this. I believe in this. I want this for our community. This matters to me. You know, what is that? What's that hope? And what's the story connected to that hope? Or, you know, another way where, you know, often I'm in a situation where I have really no idea why people are in the room, but there are a lot of people there. A lot of people just wear a question that's important to them right now, like a billboard. You know, get a flip chart marker, I mean a flip chart, rip out the collar, wear it like a billboard. Here's a question that I'm thinking about, and here's something I'm doing about the question. Here's the place it's leading me right now. How do we stay connected in the global movement? And so I'm talking for the 50th time to some tech kind of person about building networks online. <laughs> and then just say, wander around the room. Find five or six people who have really interesting questions, interesting to you. Get a table, spend 45 minutes, and just share with each other the life history of your question. <laughs> Where did it come from? Where is it going? Now again, you've put everyone, I have no way of knowing what your question is. It doesn't matter. But 
wherever you are, and, where, and, and you've been attract, you have energy for each other's curiosities. So if nothing else, you've activated the curiosity in the whole system, which is the sort of sine qua non of getting something done. I heard several conversations over the last few days about what happens when things break down or you have limited stereotypes or you, there's a sense of estrangement or the other or we and they, all of that kind of stuff. Sally Ann Roth, who's a colleague of ours in the Talos Institute, gave a, a really profound comment. One of those things that just hits you between the eyes and you think, oh, I am going to use that for the rest of my life. And she was talking at a Talos Institute meeting about 10 years ago about work she was doing in estranged families. And she said, you know, often things shut down when someone has hurt us, and often that estrangement can be severe. Now, people can hurt us who hurt us directly or because we've been taught some kind of narrative about who they are, which has hurt our family or our people or something over time. But anyway, imagine that you're in a state of estrangement. And, and she said, in a state of estrangement, in order for things to move forward in a positive way, two things have to happen. First, you have to have a shared strategic purpose. And second, you have to reactivate curiosity in the system. And to think about this in practical terms, if you think of any relationship with someone, you know, the bully who kicked sand in your face when you were seven years old, you see the person after 40 years and you know, our instinct, we're still hurt. It's been 40 years. We haven't seen this person in the meantime. You know, but, you know, is to tell the story of the point at which you shut down. You know, that guy is such a loser. Well, now, that person at 47 is probably different than they were. Maybe they're not, but they're probably different. But you see your friend, even your weird, funny friend, on the playground from when you were seven years old, and your um, and your instinct is to say, "How are you? Where are you? What are you doing? You know, how's your family? What you know? What, tell me about your whole life." It's a whole series of questions that rebuild a relationship. Whereas when we see someone who is our enemy whether that's the boss we don't like, the coworker we don't like, the person who said no to us more times than we want to remember, we go into that next relationship expecting that to happen. <laughs> and when we do that, we shut down and operate with them out of a limited and limiting stereotype of how they will behave. So, Sally Ann said, you have to reactivate the curiosity in the system, but People won't do that unless there's a purpose big enough around which to gather. <laughs> I once had a very wise friend who was a deep collaborator for 10 years in Imagine Chicago, and I said, Barbara, you have the most <coughs> astonishing staff, a lot of retired Peace Corps volunteers, returned Peace Corps volunteers. Yes, you can find an edge there somewhere. Thank you. Um, and I said, how do you find such fantastic staff? And she said, I only hire for one thing. I only hire people who care more about what's important than who's important. Absolutely brilliant insight. You know, that says we're here to get something done that matters. And let's keep it in focus. So, you know, to your earlier question, I mean, my strategy, not that it always works, because I'm also a human and I also operate out of limited stereotypes about people that have hurt me, is to just ask a question. And the first question is to refresh that sense of what we're here to do. You know, I, you know, because you're a boss and you hopefully share a common mission. If you don't believe in the mission, you need a different job. If you do believe in the mission, then always being the person who refreshes the sense of mission and its purpose and its importance, and in light of that mission and importance, is now curious about something <laughs> which can open things up, is a way of keeping the system open. Again, I don't mean to preach to the choir, but this, this is, you know, to me that's very practical. So if you're back to the estranged relationship, 
to go back and say, what's the point in getting back together? You know, why have a conversation at all? What is that purpose? <laughs> And then, what are the questions that you're genuinely curious about? And one way, the way Sally Ann said that, which I thought was fantastic, was to say, you know, what is a question you would like to ask to understand them as they are now or to understand their perspective? And what's a question you would appreciate being asked? I love that question. You want an icebreaker that will work 100% of the time? That is it. Write it down. What is a question you would appreciate being asked? You go into a group of people who think they know each other well, or a group of people who have never met, and said, just write on your name tag. What is a question you would appreciate being asked? Because you would get to talk about something that matters to you. And it will work all the time, because by definition. And even when I ask you the question that you designed, you like me for asking it as if I have some particular insight into what matters to you just because I asked you the question that matters to you. And yeah, oh, I've got 10 minutes. OK, all right, we're in slide two. That's why you have a slide pack. <laughs> OK, so we'll just go to the big meta slide. Um, so you know, the second thing is, is about recognizing, and this goes back to the heart of social construction, you know, people can only see what they can see. That's not their fault. That's the way life is for them. And that got born out of real relationships over time. Languages that embody relationships, ways of understanding, ways of being taught, what, you, what gained authority for you over time, that is the way they see. <laughs> that is their truth. That is, that's not only their truth, it's their world. So if you want to get something done, you have to create space. I love this David Cooper writer quote, there is no immaculate perception. And you know, we create these worlds out of which we live. But that also means that in order to make them visible, and not just to make them visible, but to honor them, we have to have ways of making them public, especially in the service of the task. So again, if I'm teaching at the chaos pilots, and I say, you know, you're here you are in year one, what is, you know, what's your deepest hope for something that could make the world a better place? Even a small, a small change that could make a big difference. That really probably drew you to wanting this kind of education. Something you want to create, something you want to be different, something you're leaning into. When everyone shares that hope, and then I often add a second activity to that, which is said, put, put, under, put under your picture a question that you think would engage others in dialogue with you about that. So when people do that, because you've done it and I've done it, I am highly unlikely to trample on your dream. Now if I say, what's the most important social issue, and we're going to vote and put up dots next to the one that has most people, now we're going to fight. If I say, what's your dream and something you're doing about it and a way that I can engage with you around it, now we're in a relationship on demand in five minutes about what matters to me. Anyway, lots of ways to do this. We also involve lots of arts and dancing. I mean, I, I like to move. Um, you know, visual, visual facilitation which I really see as a way of making social construction visible. Huge fan. You know, you have one of the best in the world living in Denmark, Oleg Vissorensen, who is right now in Florida at my house for three months with his whole family. This is like heaven on earth for me. <laughs> because we're writing a book together about all this. You know, how do you help people see the big picture? Fantastic. I mean, it's just a fantastic, you know, it's not a technology, it's a way of making ways of seeing visible and helping groups see too. Anyway, inspiring a sense of hope and possibility, you've heard lots about that. But to just be very concrete about this, you know, the more you talk and focus attention on what's not working, the more demoralizing it is for the people involved. And conversely, the more you focus on, you know, the strengths and what works and connect those things, 
stories of possibility have power. <coughs> Things that work have power. We learn from what works. And we know from asset-based community development that connecting, discovering and connecting strengths in community is what makes for resilient communities. I love this diagram. This is another thing that I bumped into along the way and thought, oh, thank you. This is by a fantastic man in the, in the Gold Coast of Australia who's a uh, Pakistani Muslim futurist who writes brilliantly on the future of Islam, by the way, in case anybody besides me is interested in that, um, at metafutures.org. He's just a really special man. And he, he calls this thing the futures triangle. And he says, you know, when we think about the future, there are these three dynamics. There are things that pull us into the future. And think of that as the domain of motivation, inspiration, dreaming, goals. <laughs> I would go that direction even if I didn't have to. I want, I want to go there. There are things that push us into the future. The mic it can be positive or negative. The tsunami hits, the microchip gets invented. Those are both pushes. The future is now different. You don't get, <laughs> you're no longer where you were. And you can do them with them as you will, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, it comes at you as a push. And then there's the weight. And just think of this as all the baggage that we carry personally and institutionally. It, it's an is. It's not a, that's not right. It just is. The buildings are built the way they are. And I bought the computer this year 10 seconds before the really good computer came out, and my accountant is amortizing it over three years. That's real. You don't get to buy a new computer until it's off the books. Full stop. I don't care if it's revolutionizing connections. That happens. I have business cards I don't like to throw away. I don't want to move until I use my business cards. You know, so that's all of those weights, but it's also the habits we're in. We're just used to doing things a certain way. It's a weight we carry. And when you, when you look at institutional things, one thing that can be very useful, I know, I know 10 seconds. Um, one thing that can be very useful is to look at a map like this, such a simple, such a simple map but to do it individually and then to do it organizationally. So most organizations have something that they call a mission statement or a vision statement, often not created by the employees, you know, and often therefore not owned. So management sees it as a pull and the staff see it as a push. That's a big, or that's, that's a lot of the reason consultants exist. Um, but if you, if you look and you say to anyone, but what is it that, you know, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? I don't care how mad you are at the administration, why, why do you still come to this job? What is it you uniquely care about doing that you're uniquely qualified to do which gets you here? <laughs> That's the pull. And then find out how that pull aligns with the mission of the organization. If it doesn't, you have a lot of dissonance in the system. If you can determine it and also name the weights, not as bad things, but as things <laughs> that otherwise make this seemingly inevitable future happen, then you can work on them. You can anticipate them. You can deal with the resistances. It's not loaded in the same way. It just is. Um, so, you know, we need to ask some different questions. And yes, communications is at the heart of it. Sometimes people say to me, but Bliss, you know, there's so many things to be done. You know, how can one person do anything? And I say, you want one thing completely under your control that you can do. If you become the 100% reliable, never let a cynical word ever again pass your mouth, you will have changed the system in any conversation you're in. That is my sermon. You know, that cynicism is always toxic and never helpful. Because what it is, I think of this as the abortion of ideas on demand. You know, that before your idea gets going, I'm gonna be sure and shut it down out of my fear and lack of hope that something new is possible. And so unhelpful. So if you, if you just think about what does it take in this to always be the one in the room who holds space for what's possible? who's always looking at the promise of the situation instead of speaking from experience about what can't work. Yeah.
because cynicism is not sophistication, even though we seem to be confused about that in public. So, you know, if, if we know that ways of talking become constructive or destructive, and power and their, you know, words create worlds, then our choice of words and our choice of questions is highly, highly, highly determining <laughs> of how things go. And I'm not saying my choice, I'm saying every conversation we're in, we're creating a new world. So how we do that and what words we use and what questions we ask is actually constructing the world as we go. Not on its way to constructing something, it is constructing the reality out of, out of which people live. Imagine Chicago's process, so simple. Three words, understand, imagine, create. So you focus on the best of what is. You imagine what can be in completely concrete, practical ways, and then you get it done. And just like in all getting it done, you know, people need to be able to do something from which other people can learn in a way that creates enough boundaries around it that it can be accountable and move forward and be able to tell whether you got where you wanted to go or someplace different and learn. I mean, I know this is not rocket science, but, but that, that iterative process, and if you think about this again as a process that happens in every moment, in every meeting, in every project, in every campaign over time, just understand, imagine, create. Understand, imagine, create. And when you're understanding really the best of what is, what matters, <laughs> what's been the highlight, what works, whatever, then what you're gathering is the trust in the system. If you don't have the trust in the system, you have a huge trust, mistrust tax, which creates inefficiencies, lack of economy. You know, you pay so dearly for lack of trust in a system, you know, then you have fear and bureaucracy instead of a commitment to moving forward. Um, so it becomes very important to, to ask those questions in that way. Yeah. So, you know, think about, in this case, what, what questions you ask, what kinds of questions you tend to ask, what questions would be helpful. How can you ask a single question that could open things up to the next thing? For those of you photographing this, you have every single one of these in your PowerPoint pack. Um, the, I'm not gonna dwell on appreciative inquiry, I think you know it, and, and one, of the, one of the great things about it is um, that it's well documented as a movement in the world in many sectors, and it's worth reading those case studies, and if you go to the AI portal or the Taos Institute website, you'll get a lot of good examples. But, you know, this, you know, share a time of a change, or to me, one, again, one of my very favorite questions is simply, what's a small change that can make a big difference? You know, now you've just linked in one question, the fact that change happens a step at a time and can lead somewhere. And people have a hard time thinking about the big difference, but they have an easy time thinking about the small change. And you've now done that alignment <laughs> with a strategic purpose. Okay, millions of examples, millions of examples, millions of examples. Um, yeah, we'll forget that. Um, I asked when I was in, working in Scotland with Community Scotland about some images, and that's another dimension of this. We've seen so many powerful images on that screen, just pictures that we take away and hold the stories. I asked them for images of community engagement because um, they're also were very stuck in some of the same ways that it sounds like you may be. And here were some of the images, which again you have, but you know, for instance, you know, trusting an open-ended process. What's an image for that? An open book. Why is it important to have an image? Because an image can hold, create a visual language for talking into, you know, for presenting, for a dialogue tool. So again, just a thought, I know I'm, yeah. Anyway, if you care about the common good, you have to have constructive experiences of different. There are lots of ways to get there, but it's, that's what the research shows. I think this is one more, what do I have now, a half a minute? Yeah, okay, a half a minute, good. Um, <laughs> this, is another, this is another way of thinking about things. Often these understandings, I just, again, these are proved useful over time. 
that change is always happening. There's probably some cool pointer here, but I never use it on camera. See the star, see the asterisk. Well, you know, that's where change happens. You're always at the intersection of the past and the present and the future, always, in any process. And, you know, the, the trick in this is to make as possible, as large as possible, that intersection point. Which means that when you have people who, who are stuck because they're conservators, and absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm protecting the past because there's something valuable there that I want to make sure doesn't get lost. Or I only care about the future because nothing else interests me because I'm an innovator. Or I'm a, you know, I'm a manager of change, sometimes called a bureaucrat and written off. But boy, you don't have someone managing the process, you're not getting anywhere. Then think about what question you can ask. <laughs> that helps move that person not jumping out of their circle, but into the center of the circle where there's a fruitful connection happening. You know, so I may, I may say to the traditionalist, I'm so glad you're here. You know, if, as you think back over the history of this school, what is the one thing that we really have to keep sight of as we build a new campus? Or what, what's been built here will be lost? And how do we make sure in this new structure that that's well represented? You say to the budget person who said, there's no way you're going to build this for $10 million. Say, say, what could we build for $10 million? Or, you know, where could we find the next five? <laughs> because they're used to doing those things. And now you've got them into the conversation instead of just hearing no. And I'm going to just move to one other somewhere. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So, <laughs> Constructive mindsets, yes, okay, now here's one other thing. This is a tool developed in the heat of battle which has proven helpful, which is you hear in many conversations people who are stuck in the, but, you know, we're, we're here, we, you know, it can't, it won't, it, you know, we're just in a place from which we will never be able to move. And so, you know, I, I often have now created uh, simply a framework where we say, okay, we're going to gather those things, you know, let's have a shared understanding. People see differently where we are. Let's also have a shared understanding of where we want to be, for the reasons Diana was saying yesterday, that if you don't know where you want to get to, you're, you're never going to get there. I mean, just knowing what you don't want isn't sufficient to get you somewhere. But also, just knowing what you want, if you don't know where you are, is also not sufficient <laughs> to find a path from here to there. So again, without prejudice, if you have the visionary saying, but we want, put it in the column and say, okay, that's what you want. Where do you think we are? And if you're saying, oh, but we're stuck, say, but where could we move to that would be better? And then you hear, but, 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 but. And then the art is formulating that into a question that moves in that direction. So people say, nobody's gonna pay for that. We've never gotten funding for that before. So you say, good local knowledge. So the question, it sounds like, is something like, you know, how can we get sufficient funds that are sustained over time to make the community trust the process? And how much will that be? Okay, we've gathered the knowledge out of which the resistance come, but we've also moved it in the direction of what we want. And then green shoots, you say, okay, there may be, a hundred million examples of where this isn't working, but I bet there are at least 10, and one maybe next door of where you say, this has got to be possible because look at what they're doing. We heard a lot of those stories today. And you say, here's some shoots that say, this, it's possible to live this way because they're already doing it here. We're already doing it here. And then how can you tell so that you can get clarity, unpack the assumptions? Okay, I am, I'm supposed to go away now. Um, you know, so much of this is in the doing. And, yeah, too bad, you don't just have to figure it out. <laughs> um, well, we're always good to know that there are no final answers. Well, and as you can tell, that doesn't really bother me. So. <laughs> but what, what you will get this afternoon, and I'll just give you a preview, because it's my job to facilitate the what I call the so what, now what session for two hours this afternoon, is that you know, I, I would really appreciate it if between now and then you would think about the questions you really have right now. 
I don't mean in this moment, but out of these last three days where you say, you know what, when I think about getting from here to being back at work doing something I care about, here's a real question that I have that if, you know, if I got the chance to find out, to really mine the experience, talent, perspective, whatever that was in the room around this question, that would be seriously helpful. That would be useful. That would open a conversation and build a relationship. And if you can at least give some thought to that between now and whatever time it is, one o'clock that we meet, then we can devote that whole two hours to being completely focused on what matters to you most to make this useful. So it will be helpful just to do a little bit of that before you get there. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you.